All right, so it's now 12.02 Pacific, 3.02 Eastern. So I'm just going to get started on here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Brendan, uh, and this is our presentation on the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. This is everything that you need to know. It's up to date as of today. Uh, I'm joined with Duncan on, uh, on this webinar. Uh, he is from Public Loan Tracker. Uh, very excited to be talking about them as a resource as well. Uh, just as a note, I already said at the start, we do have a Q&A section down below where you can input your questions. We will also be going over your questions from the registration section. Um, we'll be discussing pretty much everything that we know about the EIDL loan as of today. Just making sure that you know everything that you need to know, that you're equipped for an application, you know what the terms are, all of that information. If you can't take notes or if you, uh, if you miss anything in the presentation, that's totally fine. This is gonna be recorded. You can listen back for reference. Uh, if there's anything that you need uh, clarification on, I also welcome you to use the Q&A section for that as well. Now, just a quick note on who we are. As you can see, that is myself on the left. I'm the voice coming into your ears and we've got Duncan as well on the call. Hi everyone. So I am a representative of Bench. I work on the client relief team there, and we are currently working our way through pretty much every bit of government documentation to try to understand these programs as concisely as possible, such that we can present this information to you, make sure that you're equipped to make the decisions that are gonna impact your business and take advantage of the resources that are available to you. Uh, but beyond that, we are also just a bookkeeping company. Uh, we connect people with our bookkeepers. We have a beautiful app that makes all of your financial information as clear and concise as possible. So whether it's day-to-day -day bookkeeping or year-end taxes, we've got you covered to make sure that you're informed on the financials of your business. And I'm really excited to be joined by Duncan from COVID Loan Tracker because I think what they're doing is amazing. So Duncan, would you like to fill us in on that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think most of the people on the webinar are familiar with COVID Loan Tracker. Um, but our, our background is back in April, my wife, Rita, and I started COVID Loan Tracker as a resource to help businesses figure out where their PPP loans were. And we transitioned into helping with idle advances, which is still an ongoing project, as many of you know. And now we've sort of transitioned into being an information resource. Um, and so this is part of a, you know, a webinar series that we're doing. Um, and so today we've had a couple on PPP loans and now we're going to focus on, on idle for all of you because we've gotten an, an overwhelming amount of questions from the community. So we thought it'd be useful to consolidate all the information we've been organizing and do it, do it through a webinar so we can reach more people. And as Brandon said, everything that is presented today, in the recording itself and the deck will be shared. Uh, we also have a blog post that Bench put together that's really informative and consolidates some of this information into about four pages, very useful. So that'll be shared as well. Beautiful. And what I love about the work that you're doing is that it's all essentially crowdsourced, correct? Like it's all coming from the people who are actually applying for the loans and their experiences? Yes, absolutely. So that sort of the, the idea behind everything we do is collective intelligence. So it started as a survey essentially to find that we asked small business owners, hey, when did you apply? Did you get your PPP loan money yet? And through that, you know, we had 30,000 or so businesses that gave us that information across every state and every place you can imagine. And so we got a lot of collective intelligence. So what we've basically been trying to do is, is harness the power of uh, the collective intelligence of all these small businesses to help one another. And that's incredible. As, as someone who's working very closely with what the SBA is putting out there, there are gaps of information that they're just not reporting on. And the fact that we can fill in those gaps with other people's experiences and have it in a centralized place. Uh, as a stats geek, I just, I love that fact. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem that everyone's dealing with, and I'm sure everyone on the webinar can understand this, is that these rules that they're making are new. They're changing on the fly, which we've all seen. There are lots and lots of real life scenarios that don't fit cleanly into the rules. And so that leaves business owners with a lot of doubts and a lot of questions. Hopefully we can give some guidelines on those today so that everyone feels a little bit more comfortable. Perfect. So I'm going to, uh, well, just one last reminder, we do have the Q&A section for your questions and comments. I see we've already had a couple submitted. Thank you for that. Uh, but I'm going to get into an overview of the EIDL itself. I'm known to ramble about these things. I get a little bit overly excited when talking about them. So please, Duncan, reel me in if I go a little bit uh, off topic here. 
Um, but a little bit of background information on the EIDL. I think there might be a misperception that the EIDL is specifically around COVID, but it was actually a program that was in place prior to COVID, but made widely available in all 50 states as a reaction to the pandemic. The EIDL was supposed to be a, um, a program that was in place uh, just in perpetuity. Anytime there was a disaster that occurred in a region, there would be this loan available to any businesses that were affected in that region, hence the name the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So the maximum loan amount for the program itself was $2 million. However, what we saw with this round of funding in reaction to the pandemic is that loan offers were being capped at $150,000, such that it would be more widely available. It's not a forgivable loan. It's the PPP, which is the other program that we mentioned before that is the forgivable loan. However, the idle advance grant is automatically forgiven. It's a tax-free grant when you receive it. So you don't have to worry about repaying that part back. Now, before I go on, I just want to clarify something about the advanced grant. As of July 11th, the application for the advanced grant was closed. If your application was submitted prior to July 11th, you will still be considered for the advanced grant. But essentially, they had gotten to a point where the amount of funds that were allocated to that program were diminished enough that they needed to close off the applications. So you can still apply for an EIDL loan. However, you cannot apply for the advanced grant on the application anymore. Uh, collateral is required if the loan amount is going to be over $25,000 and a credit check is required. So just be aware of that if you're, uh, if you're afraid of anything affecting your credit score. There's also an automatic payment deferral of 12 months, meaning that you won't have to make your first payment on the loan itself for those 12 months. And you apply directly on the SBA's website. The EIDL is managed completely by the SBA, whereas the PPP is actually being run through different lending institutions. The EIDL is all in one place. It's an online application. And if you want to have a walkthrough of the application itself, our channel, the Bench YouTube channel, actually does have a walkthrough of the application line by line. If you are going to receive an EIDL loan, the loan terms are 3.75. 5% interest for businesses, just 2.75% for not-for-profits, and the loan terms are pretty long. We've seen it generally being in the range of 15 to 30 years. This makes the EIDL one of the most, uh, one of the best options in terms of lending on the market. If you have, if you're, you were thinking about um, applying for a loan at any time prior to the pandemic, this is the best loan in the terms of interest and in the, um, in the terms of when you can pay it on the market. Just a note, Brandon, uh, and to the audience. Uh, one, we're going to do it like we've done in the past where we do the deck at the beginning and cover the basics and then we're going to have a good uh, Q&A section at the end. You guys sent in hundreds of questions that we've organized, so we'll address those at the end. And then, Brandon, I just had a question for the audience on the previous slide about the collateral. Um, one thing I think some people are wondering is, on the collateral part, is there a personal guarantee in the loan if it's over 25000 or not? Yes, so it's not if the loan is over 25,000, but if the loan is over $200,000, that is when they will be requiring a personal guarantee. I see, okay, thank you. And I see that we got a question from Jean Ann Fisher regarding the collateral. Uh, she mentioned that she got um, $33,200 funded on May 31st, and no collateral was required. Uh, the collateral issue, it's not necessarily a new one. It was just a moving target that the SBA had in place. Um, and it was really when the idle applications reopened on July, uh, sorry, not July, June 15th, that uh, these, um, the collateral became more of a focal point and they started to push that a bit more. Uh, so had, with you receiving your funds before then, uh, it, it's not a surprise that they didn't ask for collateral. I don't believe they will be following up with you to, uh, request it, but just something to keep in mind for future applicants is that they are using that $25,000 as uh, the standard for when they require collateral. Uh, now for the EIDL, there are some restrictions to the uses, but it's, it's still very open-ended. It's intended to cover working capital expenses, which we loosely define as just day-to-day -day expenses. So you can think of that as payroll, your accounts payable, uh, any bills that you may not be able to have uh, paid had the disaster not occurred, so that you could have paid had the disaster not occurred, any fixed debt. 
So you can think of it as something to cover things like your rent, your utilities, uh, anything that you need to facilitate your business's day-to-day -day operations. If you are going to be in possession of an EIDL and a PPP loan, it's important to know that these two loans cannot be used for the same expenses. So if you're going to be using your PPP loan to cover your payroll expenses or your rent or utilities for a given month, you cannot use your EIDL on those expense types as well. So the best practice here is to use the PPP for its restricted uses and then hold on to that EIDL for all other working capital, seeing as that you'll have more leniency in how you can use it. Um, as I mentioned before, the loan does not have a forgiveness aspect like the PPP. However, the, the advance grant, if you did receive one, does not need to be repaid. So seeing as that the uses of the EIDL is extremely broad in this definition of working capital, we figure that it's best to focus on the misuses. What are the wrong uses of the EIDL uh, to really facilitate your understanding of where you should be putting this money? Now, the loan terms are very specific about these points, um, and these points are the ones that you cannot be using the funds on. That's dividend and bonuses for uh, shareholders, disbursements to owners. However, W-2 pay is eligible, and you can pay yourself for any services that you put into the business. The example that I always like to use is if you were going to pay a contractor, say, $300 for video editing, and instead you choose to do it yourself, you can then take that amount. Uh, repayment of stockholder or principal loans is also not permitted. Repair or replacement of physical damages. The refinancing of long-term debt, especially any debt that's owed to the SBA or another federal institution. Relocation or the purchasing of fixed assets, which is typically characterized by long-term use, meaning it goes beyond the one year and uh, cost being greater than $2,500. The reasoning for these restrictions is they want this loan to be something that sustains your business as opposed to adding on any assets or benefiting the shareholders. They want those funds to be used as that working capital. Brendan, just a question here. Imagine you are a small business owner and you have some form of equipment, say a dry cleaner, and the, the machines that you use for whatever reason uh, stop functioning in the normal course of business. So would that be barred from being able to use idle, idle money on such a repair? That's what it seems thinking. like a normal co course of business item. It's not like you're trying mm -hmm. to grow the company. So I, I just want to make sure that everyone uh, understands that. Definitely. And, and there is a little bit of ambiguity around that right now. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of clarity on how they're going to be evaluating uh, what is a fixed asset. Um, so a repair or a purchase of equipment that's necessary for the business, uh, our understanding is that it would be permitted by that definition of uh, working capital, seeing that it is being put into a, um, a facet of the business that is essential for its operations. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then one last note on the restrictions is that refinancing would entail paying an atypical amount towards a loan line of credit or credit card. So for instance, paying down the entirety of a balance that has accrued over a couple of years or a longer period of time. Uh, and one last note that I wanna make about these misuses, this is only gonna come up in the case of an audit. If someone is actually going to audit your use of the EIDL, we're still not entirely sure on what the probability of that is going to be or how strict they're going to be. And we're hoping that once, um, once applications are closed and most of the funds have been dispersed, that there will be more clarity in how they will be handling this going forward. So if you haven't applied for the EIDL yet, uh, you apply through the SBA website. You don't have to go through any external institutions. It's all in one place, all online. Uh, this idle application, I was very impressed with how streamlined and easy it is, seeing as that I've seen how convoluted some of these other applications can be. They've made it as simplified as possible. Um, there are two numbers that you will have to bring to this application, which is your gross revenues and your cost of goods sold. And the period that that's going to cover is February 29th, uh, 2019 to January 2020. So it's going to be a 12 month total over that period. Unfortunately, you can't be using just your 2019 numbers. They are specifically requesting this period of time. Uh, within the application, 
this is now no longer relevant, but uh, there was the option of checking off a box to receive the EIDL advance grant, uh, which was approximately $1,000 per employee. And uh, once again, if you're looking for a walkthrough of this application, we do have a video walkthrough on the Bench YouTube page that's worth checking out. So as I mentioned before, the grant itself is closed. However, if you did receive one, I want to go over this information just to make sure that you're informed on the specifics around it. If you receive the grant, um, it's, it's going to be completely forgiven straight off the bat. You don't have to worry about, um, you don't have to worry about restricted uses. Uh, that's funds that you can use however you see fit uh, to immediately help out your business. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind is that this grant is going to affect your PPP loan forgiveness amount if you are in possession of one. Seeing as that the PPP loan, if it is completely forgiven, is considered a grant in itself. They're trying to limit businesses to just one tax-free grant through the pandemic. Uh, I have an example in which I will go through how exactly this is going to affect your PPP loan forgiveness amount on the next slide. Uh, but as I mentioned before, as of July 11th, the grant program was closed and they allocated a total of $20 billion through that program to businesses. So this is just a very simple example of how the PPP and the EIDL grant interact. If you've received a PPP loan of $10,000 and an EIDL grant of $1,000, let's say that hypothetically you follow all the PPP guidelines and you're eligible for 100% forgiveness on that loan. Because you've received that $1,000 grant, you will only be eligible for forgiveness on $9,000 of that PPP loan. And that outstanding $1,000 will need to be paid back at 1% interest. However, just a note on that is that you can actually prepay your balance down for the PPP at no penalty and no fees. Uh, so you can actually pay it off before it accrues any interest. So j just an additional note for everyone. Um, we've talked to a lot of people involved in this and it seems to us like the the uh, lack of forgiveness of the $1,000 in Brendan's example might have been an accident uh, by, the, by the government. So we're pushing with another, a number of other small business companies, we're writing a demand letter to try and get this forgiven because in, in our opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion, it's gonna cause a gigantic and senseless administrative burden of calls to the SBA because that means millions of businesses are gonna have to figure out how to repay so sometimes as little as $1,000, which is probably not even worth the cost of the call centers from the SBA to deal with that. So um, anyway, we're making a push to try and get that fixed in the next wave of changes that they do to all of this. But uh, as now, the, this example is absolutely correct. Yeah, and if I could add just a, a little bit of additional color to that, uh, Congress and the Senate are coming back together for discussions uh, next week. They're coming off of the recess in which they will be debating new stimulus packages. And one of the things that we're hoping to see is auto forgiveness for loans under a certain amount. Uh, there's a very shocking proportion of loans that are greater than $150,000. How many of the funds they take up should do, uh, relative to the actual amount of the loans for that amount. So any loans uh, under $150,000, if we could see the government push for that to be auto forgiven, there's a huge administrative burden that's relieved. Brendan, I actually have those stats handy. So 86% oh. of the loans, the actual volume of the number of loans are under 150,000, but those 86% of loans, so the vast majority of the borrowers, are probably applicable to most everyone on this call, of those 86 loans, they only account for 23% of the dollars that were actually allocated in the program because of how much volume the small amount of big loans take up. And so basically forgiving that 86% that are under 150K would be you know, gigantic for small businesses, but also, uh, as Bren Brennan just said, a huge <laughs> a relief for administrative burden for the SBA and the banks. And one last note on the idle grant and the interaction with the PPP. I see a question from Ariane here. Uh, is the PPP really a tax-free grant if the expenses funded are not tax deductible? And that's a really great question because there is a, currently a lot of discussion that's occurring on that side of the topic, which is if you've used the PPP funds uh, for what would normally be tax deductible expenses, are they now no longer going to be tax deductible at year end? 
Um, I, I follow tax Twitter very intently and there's a lot of discussion on this because of course the accountants and the bookkeepers, which I am one of them, uh, we don't want to be having to track these things in such a micro perspective of trying to figure out what the PPP loans were used on. However, yes, that is the status quo as it is right now is that anything you use PPP funds are not tax deductible at year end. And that's an IRS rule, right? As I understand, you put out a, a, a memorandum about that or something a couple months ago. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Now, the last thing I just want to cover regarding the EIDL is that there are some standards for record keeping. Again, this would be in the case of an audit, which we don't really know the probability of that quite yet. But the EIDL, uh, the EIDL requires you to maintain current and proper records for the most recent five years until three years after your loan maturity. So that means that something like bookkeeping, you will be able to produce reports upon request that show the most recent five years of activity up until three years after you've paid off the loan in full. That's going to entail financial and operating statements, such as a balance sheet and income statement, any tax returns and related filings. You're also going to be obliged to provide a, a records of earnings or dividends distributed or records of compensations to share uh, owners or shareholders, as well as any documentation of any insurance policies. Now, in terms of where you should start with this, start storing all of your invoices, receipts, and statements online and try to get your bookkeeping up to date. Um, and in addition to that, you must provide financial statements to the SBA within three months of the end of your fiscal year. Again, this is something that the SBA has not really provided any clarity on and what it's going to look like. Uh, but if we do see any update there, we will be sure to provide it. So this takes us to the question section. I see we have a lot of questions to work through here, Duncan. Uh, so if you have any idea on where to start, um, let me see. I, one comment I want to make just to everyone before we even get into the questions is just sort of mentally contextualizing the, the idle loan. Because in a lot of ways, idle is quite different to PPP. And a lot of people are doing both or were involved with one or another. But, you know, PPP was the kind of thing where you, you get the money as long as you spend it on, say, payroll and other expenses in certain proportions, it's forgiven. You know, idle doesn't have a forgiveness component, but what makes that, so it's more of a normal loan in that perspective, but what's odd about it that everyone needs to keep in mind is there are restrictions in what you can use it on. So it's not just like, you know, a personal loan that you'd get from a bank, which you can use it for whatever you want, as long as you repay it. Now, of course, Brennan pointed out that that's only really applicable in, in the event of an audit, but that gives a lot of people a lot of uncertainty. So what can we spend it on? So there's been a lot of questions about that. So we're going to go into that. The other thing is, I think especially the smaller and the sole proprietors and so forth need to pay attention. In my opinion, for small businesses, these are pretty significant reporting requirements, right? That you have to have five years of financial records on hand at any time, um, that they can request these from you at any point. So you basically have to have your books up to date at all times, um, which I know for some smaller businesses is not necessarily the way that they've been operating. So I think that's a hurdle. One other thing that jumps out at me to make you guys aware of is there's a, a clause in there about the SBA being able to order basically an independent accountant to analyze what you've presented at, at the cost to the borrower, meaning you. So there, if you think about it, if you're not currently paying a third party firm, um, maybe like bench, then there's going to be a significant element of, of bookkeeping that needs to be added uh, if you are going to do an idle. Um, and so just think about that as probably part of the cost of what you're taking out of the idle. You know, uh, some of that is going to go towards the compliance with the rules. So I just want everyone to think about that. There's actually going to be a cost of getting an idle because of the reporting requirements. So I just want to address that. Um, and then Brendan, how about I will pull up our list of questions that I got before the webinar. And then what, if you could browse through the Q&A, I know we've answered some of them, but if you see any that jump out at you that we should get into, please please look at that. So I'll pull up and we can start with the pre-selected pre questions. Sounds good. I actually see two questions here that uh, seem to have gotten some backing by the audience. So I'm gonna just quickly address those. Okay. We've got one from Steven. If you can't purchase fixed assets, what about leasing them and using idle funds to make payments on the loan? That's actually totally acceptable uh, because uh, you will be putting them towards that liability and making standardized payments. 
so if that is an option for you to lease the equipment instead of purchasing fixed assets, you will be able to use the idle loan for that. Um, but just a reminder that you can't, uh, you can't really go over and above those payments. You need to be doing the standardized payments. As soon as you start going over and above those scheduled payments, that's when it starts to be considered refinancing, which is that area that they don't want you to be treading in. Uh, we also have another one uh, from Ronnie. Can you pay your federal taxes with the EIDL? And yes, um, this is, it still is like a little bit of an ambiguous area. And I hate how much I'm gonna be saying that throughout this presentation, because ultimately <laughs> there are some sections where there's just not enough clarity for us to say conclusively. But based on the definition of working, working capital, that is totally permissible. Well, Brendan, if these weren't, if the program wasn't vague and ambiguous, then there wouldn't be a need for webinars. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I should be thanking them for, uh, for yeah, my exactly. Talk right now. Uh, so okay. Um, then I so we have about. I know I selected about sixty or seventy of these uh, into a different sheet. So basically, there are sort of all the questions that, you, that everyone asked fell into sort of four or five categories regarding eligibility, use of funds, tracking, a repayment, and then some other. Um, so why don't we just, let's start with, we've sort of been on the use of funds. So why don't we keep going with that theme for a minute? Um, we covered the mechanics of PPP forgiveness versus idle advance. Uh, Give me one moment. What about for business credit cards, Brendan? Is that something you can use idle money for to pay off business credit cards? Yeah, definitely. And one of the questions that we've been getting a lot of is people saying, well, they use their credit card to rack up expenses and then pay down that balance. Um, mm -hmm. And in that case, yeah, it's totally permissible to use the funds to pay down credit card balances, especially if they are like strictly business cards. Um, but again, just be wary of trying to not go outside of your status quo of the payments that you're making. So if you were making, say, scheduled $500 payments uh, towards the balance every single month, doing something that goes over and above that could be considered refinancing. Um, so the best advice that we can give at this time is try to stay within that status quo of what your practices were prior to receiving the EIDL. Okay, that sounds good. Brandon, in general, in the use of funds, so this is obviously going to be one of the more ambiguous questions, but could we address briefly uh, the, whatever the line is on idle can't be used for expansion? You know, what does that mean? So what, it, what are we concluding or how do we conceptualize the difference between normal working capital needs and expansion, right? And especially given the context of a lot of these businesses took a hit during COVID and lockdown. Now they're trying to come back up. So I'm just wondering if there's any best practices that we could think about uh, for businesses like just general guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely one of the difficult, ambiguous questions, seeing as that there isn't a lot of clarity around how they would define expansion. Uh, the way that I like to conceptualize it is essentially with working capital, you should be asking yourself the question, is this something that I need or is this something that would be of a bigger benefit beyond basic needs? Uh, if they find that, they're, that you're using your money to expand the business, it's not really the intended purpose of the EIDL. The EIDL is meant to sustain businesses that are going through a period of economic injury. Anything that gets into that expansion territory of like trying to grow as a business it would possibly show that you are not of need of the loan if you're using the funds for those additional purposes. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. And let's, uh, one key question a lot of people are asking is about compensating themselves. Um, and so, you know, obviously some people are more familiar with how you can use PPP to pay yourself as say a sole proprietor, or if you're an employee of the company that you own, what are the general rules around idle about uh, owner compensation? Or how, how does that work? Yeah, so it's one of those things where you shouldn't be drawing from EIDL funds. However, you can use EIDL funds to compensate you for the work that you're putting into your business. Uh, so if you have a way of tracking what your costs would typically be uh, for someone else to be doing the services that you are providing to the business, you can use that as a barometer for how much you can compensate yourself for those services. 
Um, so I use the example of like the video editing prior, where if you could have hired a contractor for $300, but you did the job yourself, you can uh, compensate you for that. Essentially, this is going to be a bit of you get to dictate the value, um, but you should be basing it on the labor that you're providing to the business. If you have not provided any services to the business itself, you should not be providing yourself compensation. But if you had a very labor intensive week uh, where you did a lot of services for your business, then of course you're entitled to that compensation. Okay, but you can't use it for regular payroll. Is that the idea? Oh, sorry. You can use it for a regular payroll if you are running payroll, uh, just not if you are currently in possession of a PPP loan that is being used to cover that payroll and stuff. Okay. Yes, yeah, so you covered that in the deck. So basically, yeah, don't use the idle and the PPP on the same expenses as Brendan said before. It's a good rule of thumb. Um, okay, one question we had, I guess this is kind of merging into eligibility, but several people asked questions about can I, how do I request more money than I originally applied for? And, or is there a way to quickly give the money back if you no longer want uh, the idol? Unfortunately, there's no way to uh, request more funds than you've been offered. Uh, you can try to start the conversation with your loan officer um, and, and try to contact the SBA and have a discussion around it. Um, but unfortunately, seeing as that there's not a lot of transparency in how they uh, decide on the loan amounts, it, it's difficult to like pinpoint a reasoning for the loan amount being wrong. Whereas if, if you look at something like the PPP, where there was total transparency into the calculation, you had more grounds to have a reassessment. Um, so there's not really like a, a best way to, um, to have your loan amount reassessed. In terms of paying back the loan amount, uh, seeing as that payments are deferred for 12 months, you can pay back the balance in full early, uh, in which case you will not have any interest or fees incurred, and it will be off your business, uh, sorry, off your balance sheet at no expense. Okay. And just a, a follow-up, um, by the way, about the use of funds, PPV versus either Heather, and the question and answer just asked a good question, which is, okay, so say you're, you use all your PPP funds, can you then switch to paying payroll with your idle after the PPP funds have been exhausted? Yeah, and that's a perfect example, 100%. If you're out of PPP funds and you no longer have any to use towards payroll uh, or rent or lease or utilities, anything you were using that PPP for, you can now use the EIDL for. And just an additional point about that, it might be a good idea if you choose to exhaust your PPP funds in say whatever forgiveness timeline you put, whether it's eight or 24 weeks. So if you use the eight week one, then once you're outside of the eight weeks and all of it's been uh, exhausted, then it seems like a really natural, clear way to then start using idle towards payroll. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Okay, that sounds good. Um, can we speak a little bit, this is more of a program question, but it was a good one, which is, do you see that the, especially with the current talks going on in Congress, the 150 cap uh, was something that a lot of people weren't expecting. You, is there any discussion that you know of about that uh, being lifted for further rounds or uh, just wondering? Uh, there's not really any clarity there. Um, it, from what I've been reading, a stimulus package would not be focused on um, topping up the programs that are already in place, but rather uh, looking to develop new programs that are going to be more focused in the um, in like the audience of businesses that it would be servicing. So, for instance, having a new program that would have stricter restrictions on who would be eligible based on revenue loss or number of employees. Uh, so, we're not really expecting the EIDL to have any change in its terms uh, or see any top up there. Okay, um, couple sort of program related questions as well. Our eligibility is. You know, we've gotten a lot of emails personally about people that have been rejected because of credit scores. Do you know, is there any process by which you can reapply or appeal that decision if you have been sort of boxed out because of your credit score? Yes, there actually is going to be a, a reapplication or a reconsideration process. Uh, so if you feel like you were declined previously, um, but you think there might have been a mistake or that your eligibility might have changed over the period of time of your last application, there will be a process in place for that. Uh, I don't believe that process is 
instituted yet, but uh, we're going to have a resource on that coming out soon. Yes, and to everyone in our audience, we'll, as soon as we find that information out, we'll distribute it in a newsletter so everyone sees it. Um, and related to, so on the other side of that question is, you know, let's say you're a business and you took out an idol and unfortunately during COVID or now in the future, you have to close uh, while that loan is still owed. What happens to that loan once you, if you have to close your business? Right. So the EIDL does have, um, does have something in place for that. If a business is forced to close, that mm -hmm. would really be the only instance that a loan could potentially be forgiven under the EIDL program is if you default on it, they do have a system in place for that. Um, so if you are forced to close your business um, and, and it's a, it's a permanent closure, uh, there will be like a, a relief system in place to ensure that you don't have to pay back the entirety of the loan. Okay. That's um that's good to know. And what does it, do you know if that happens, how will that affect personal credit scores of the individuals that own the companies that took these loans? Uh, that's unfortunately something I, I don't know at this time. I know. I know it's a, a anxiety on people's minds if that happens. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, one question a lot of people have, it's sort of perfunctory, but important is let's say you applied for an idle advance. What I've seen in my own experience and Rita's experience is generally, if you took an idle advance, the SBA hounds you sending you emails to try and get you to take an idle loan. Um, and I'm wondering, is it okay? I just want confirmation for everyone. Is it okay to take an idle advance, but then not follow through and take an idle loan? Yes, uh, completely uh, acceptable. And we actually had a member of a research team call up the SBA and he was on hold for, I believe, like three hours to get this answer, which is if you want to decline the loan, the best practice is to choose an amount of $1 and then to just pay back that balance immediately. When you receive your idle offer, you will be given like the sliding scale with a maximum amount that you can select and choose huh. any amount lower than that. So you can actually choose an amount of $1. That's going to prevent them from hounding you as well as um, if there is any sort of reassessment of the grant program. Uh, it will show that you have taken the idle loan as well. So there's, a, there's multiple added benefits there. Um, and then you just have to pay back a $1 loan. So I hope everyone saw that. We should note that in our follow-up email. That's a great uh, little little trick that you found. We, <laughs> we love those. So yeah, take out a $1 loan on your idle and pay it back and then it'll stop, stop bothering you. <laughs> um, I see. Tracking. Okay. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about this, the, what you can use the money on and so forth. Let's talk a little bit, let's start at a high level and then move downward. What do you think is the best way to keep track of this money? Um, and I'll, I'll pre preface that by saying we've covered this significantly in our PPP webinars previously. Um, so I'm wondering if, Brendan, if you can highlight best practices in an ideal world and then maybe in a practical world about how they should keep track of this money because obviously there's the sort of spending requirements and what you can use with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great question because ultimately, if you're receiving an EIDL loan, there's a possibility that you're still going to be in your basic business operations and receiving revenue there. So you're going to have all this money flowing into your bank account and then choosing how you use the funds. What I recommend in this case, if you're not on a bookkeeping software or if you're not working with a bookkeeper and you want to track these funds, is any time you tr have an expense that is applicable for the e EIDL, just note it down somewhere, maybe save the receipt in a Dropbox, something like that such that you can track it. Ultimately, when it comes to the time where if they choose to audit uh, how you use the EIDL loan, then you will have a complete outline of what you've decided to use that loan amount on. That way you don't have to worry about any potential crossover of what did I use my sales revenue on? What did I use another funding source on? That way you have complete clarity in what you've opted to use the EIDL loan on. That sounds like very good practice. And, and about, you know, third party softwares, is there, you know, is there good ways to enable those to help, you know, organize the overall management? Uh, 
well, obviously bench, in my opinion, is the absolute best when it comes to this. Um, another thing that I just want to mention with bench is um, we have our bookkeeping team all uh, trained up on these relief programs. Uh, and they'll be able to provide you with insight on these programs. If they can't provide you with the inf insight that you need, uh, they'll escalate it to my team, the client relief team for further information. And they'll be able to actually advise on these situations. So if you're looking at how you're using your EIDL, you can actually talk to a real life person, which in my experience of trying to get in contact with these federal offices is a huge plus. You can get immediately access to talking to a real person for answers to these questions and insight on how you're using your EIDL funds. Uh, that's very good to know. Uh, by the way, we're gonna distribute a link for all of you to be able to explore Bench's services in this regard uh, immediately following the, the webinar. Um, what about the use of separate bank accounts? Do you think that that's necessary in this case? Everyone's worried about commingling funds, especially if you have your normal working capital then you have PPP and then you have idle. Yeah, separate bank accounts, uh, anytime you're looking to track uh, like restricted use of funds, whether it be the EIDL, whether it be the PPP, or whether it be any restricted grants you might receive down the line, it's always best practice because then you just get like that full activity of how you're using the funds uh, all laid out for you, as well as you can also track like the balance remaining of those funds that is left to be used. So uh, it's one of the best practices you can have. If you don't have the option of opening up a new bank account, if you can dictate one bank account as being where all that activity is going to take place, that's also suitable best practice. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then some sort of perfunctory questions is, how does, so obviously you have one year until you have to start repaying it. Is it clear yet what the repayment process, how it's going to work? Meaning like, is it a direct deposit that you, uh, or how is the SBA going to actually collect payment from you? Is that clear? Um, unfortunately, it's, it's not clear quite yet. I think that's something that they've kind of put on the back burner until absolutely necessary. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll probably get some more insight on that closer to when people's 12 months are going to be um, uh, concluding, but as of now, there, there is an insight into how these payments are going to look. Okay, that's good to know. Um, you know, I, there's a couple of questions that were in our sort of other section that we had, and I think some of them are quite interesting, and they're little things that I think might be important for people to focus on. So, and granted, I uh, just want to make a point. I got some of these questions. I came up with them. Some of them personally, some were asked. Uh, I don't know how much standardization there is in the actual loan offer document. Uh, for instance, we had someone say that she had a $33,000 loan, but she didn't have collateral where a lot of people at that size do, and it depends on dates. So these are probably changing, but some, from some of the ones that we've observed from uh, users, there were some interesting things in there. So, and I, and sort of to flag up. So, um, and Brandon, I, I don't know if you know about these, but so for instance, there's a, where possible buy American made equipment. Um, and I know for some businesses that rely on, on physical equipment, that can be challenging at times. So I'm wondering if you, if you are familiar with that or if you have any guidance on that. Yeah, uh, definitely familiar with it. It has been flagged up to us before. Yeah. Um, again, like it, it's hard to tell how much, how, how granular an SBA audit would be in this case of trying to figure out if you only bought American-based equipment. Uh, but yeah, definitely just something to keep in mind if you are going to be using these funds, if you have the option of choosing one or the other to try and choose the American product. Okay, so that's, that's good to know. That's causing some people anxiety. An example, my, my sister, uh, is an art conservationist and she runs her own small business and she needs to buy microscopes to do paint analysis. But the microscopes are only made by Japanese companies. So she's anxious about whether she can use her idle loan for that. And so I know that there's a lot of consternation uh, in different in niche sectors that maybe there's uh, equipment that the best standard is not American. So um, just something to bear in mind. What about um, this need for hazard insurance that I see in the uh, idle loan offer? Yeah, again, something that we've seen flagged up to us uh, a couple of times. Um, it, it's important to remember that 
with this EIDL loan, the program was initially in place when there was actual disasters taking place in specific regions. So, of course, if a, if a hurricane occurs some bit, uh, somewhere and uh, you're eligible for an EIDL in that instance, that's why they'd want you to have that hazard uh, insurance in place. So seeing as that this is kind of an unprecedented uh, series of events that they're trying to keep us covered for, um, it's unclear as to whether that hazard insurance is actually going to be uh, necessary, seeing as that it doesn't provide the same benefits as it would in the case of other physical disasters. Okay. Um, one other thing that uh, people ask about is the no relocation clause. And I was wondering if you could speak about the spirit behind that and sort of, but it says there's flexibility that you, if you ask the SBA, et cetera. Yeah, again, another one of those really interesting, ambiguous areas, uh, because again, they're, they're, they're trying to prevent businesses from um, having like these opportunities of growth that would be considered a misuse of the EIDL program. They really want to try and keep businesses sustained. Uh, so if relocation is essential to your business and you can flag it up to the C uh, SBA, um, then of course it, it would be a permissible use of the funds. Uh, but just try and keep in mind that necessity element. Okay, um, very good to know. You know, one thing that jumped out at me in particular, this is a question I came up with, but I thought it'd be useful to address everyone, is there's a lot of different clauses in the offering document where it says without the express consent of the SBA, written consent of the SBA, you can't do this, that, or the other. And one of the things in particular that was interesting to me is it, it talks about selling assets or selling collateral, what's defined as collateral in the offering group. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, what that really means in a practical sense. And then also what occurred to me about that is, does that bar a company from being able to sell their business while they have an idle loan that's still outstanding? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of clarity to offer there. Yeah. Um, this is something that is also of interest to us, especially seeing as that the terms of the loan are being as long as they are 15 to 30 years that can really hamstring certain businesses and limit their opportunities going forward uh, just because they are in possession of this loan. Um, so there is some ambiguity and a lack of clarity there. Unfortunately, I can't provide a concrete answer at this time. Yeah, I, I suspect that that's the case. And I'm mostly just flagging this up for everyone to pay attention to some of these terms. I mean, it's a 19 page document that I, that I most recently reviewed for an offer. So there's a lot of things in there that people should, should pay attention to. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Brendan, is there any relationship between unemployment uh, insurance, general unemployment assistance, and what's going on with that and EIDL? I know it's a sensitivity point for people with the relationship between PPP and UI, and I'm just wondering if there's any specific things guidelines that people have to be concerned about as it relates uh, unemployment and idle? Uh, not at this time, no. The only uh, thing to keep in mind is, of course, if you are collecting uh, these expanded unemployment benefits, the PUA, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, mm -hmm. if you are receiving that, um, you are going to have to be reporting any income that you may have earned over that period of time. You're going to have to essentially be showing that your business is not going to be able to sustain you. Um, if you do receive the EIDL, uh, you then cannot be using that to facilitate your income. If you are receiving PUA, uh, if you do that, you're going to have to report that income to the uh, to your unemployment office, and they will adjust your benefits. Uh, but just to keep in mind that interaction, if if you are receiving the PUA, you should not be taking. Um, income or payment from the business. Okay, that's, that's very good to know. And one thing I want to also point out to everyone um, is I've noticed some people thought originally when they were applying for EIDL that the loan was going to be basically a balloon payment that you have to repay at the end of 30 years. But actually, if you look closely at the documents once you get them, this is a, this is a monthly de debit out of your account that starts one year after you take the loan. And it says it's going to be fixed amounts. Um, and so that's, as I understand, how the repayment's going to work. Is that correct, Bryn? Uh, yeah, that's our understanding as well. Okay, I see. Um, 
Brendan, I think for the purposes, and I actually haven't done this in previous webinars, but I would, I would like to do it now, which is, it, at least to me, uh, bench seems like it would be quite useful because of all the expense tracking that needs to go on here. I mean, it's not like PPP where you just have to show X amount went to payroll. Like there's significant reporting requirements that could theoretically be asked for by the SBA. So I thought it might be just worthwhile at the end here uh, for you to tell everyone kind of what, what Bench could do in terms of organizing this for you to make this simpler. Of course, and I'll just take us to the next slide where we have our partner referral link here. You can try it free. What we have is we have a trial month where we'll basically take a month of your financial statements and put it into the app and show you how it works in terms of the breakdown of the expenses. And if you choose to proceed past then, you can get 20% off your first six months. Uh, I've been a bookkeeper at Bench for the last uh, two and a half, almost three years. And what I think the best value that comes from the app is just the sheer amount of clarity that you can receive from just a bank statement. You put your bank statement into the app or you have these automatic connections that takes that information automatically into the app. And then a bookkeeper is going to go through all of that activity, put it in all the correct expense categories, reach out for any clarification that they require. And we're going to take a whole month's worth of your business's activity and put it into something that makes sense to you, that provides insight to you so you can change your decision making on the fly. But beyond that, of course, if you have received the EIDL, um, the record keeping aspect of it is going to be completely satisfied by Bench. We were, we're going to offer you uh, balance sheets and income statements that you can refer to and provide for reporting if requested by the SBA. We also have our Bench Tax Program, where we will take care of tax filing for you by connecting you with a tax professional, which means we can take your books from start to finish over the course of a year and have you ready for tax filing, in addition to providing you with just that monthly ongoing insight. So there's a ton of value here for businesses in terms of understanding their financials, but there's also a ton of value here for businesses that are going to be taking on these relief program loans to be meeting those reporting requirements, as well as putting you in contact with your bookkeeper who can provide you with some more insight on these programs that can provide you with additional information and of course provide you with uh, the reports that you need to satisfy those requirements. Uh, Duncan, I think you're still on mute there. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, I stepped away. I realized that this link here is not clickable um, because it's, it's an image and it's not copyable either, as I understand. So Rita is currently pasting that into the Q&A for the last question that was asked so you all can copy and paste it instead of having to look at it. So technical error on our side. Yeah, thank you for getting that sorted. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Brandon, anything else that you feel like we should cover right now? Uh, the last thing that I just want to say about the EIDL is, you know, we've had so many conversations with businesses over the past couple of months where they've been asking us, is the EIDL right for us? And ultimately, I, I, I look at the EIDL application as kind of a job application where you're just casting a stone into the water to see what the ripple effects will be. And ultimately, you can choose later down the line whether it's right for you. If you're not afraid of getting that credit check, I highly suggest applying because if, you know, if something changes over the next couple of days and you decide you don't want the EIDL anymore, or if they offer you an amount that you think is too much, you can adjust that amount and you can really get a loan that fits your needs on your terms with this program. It's, it's incredibly unique in that aspect. I've never seen a loan before where you can request an amount of $1 simply to get, get a loan officer off your back. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind that you can really tailor make this loan into something that is accessible and appropriate for your business and where you stand financially at this time on just extremely lenient terms, that 3.75% interest rate over 15 to 30 years uh, and the ability to repay it early. I just, I really want to push everybody to engage with this program and take advantage of it while it's available because I've seen the businesses that haven't taken that approach and haven't attempted on it uh, when the idol closed that first time around, they were feeling extremely lost. And I just, I want to do my best to ensure that no business is in that position again, while this program is available. 
I absolutely agree. And I, and the one thing that's amazing about this is the, the interest rate is very low. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of interest rate that a blue chip company would raise in the, in the debt markets right now. And it's available for small businesses with, with long terms and easier terms. Um, so it seems like a great idea. Brandon, actually one last question as we finish up here, which is the question that everyone hopes, which is, do you think that there's any chance in the future that idle loans get forgiven? Ooh, that's that's a very tough question to answer. <laughs> it's basically me looking into the crystal ball. Uh, and unfortunately, my crystal ball is not tuned in with what the SBA is thinking at this time. It's a foggy crystal ball at the moment? It's a very, very foggy crystal ball. <laughs> Um, it, it's hard to say. Maybe they decide some element of it is to be forgiven some point in time down the line. Uh, it's it's completely unclear, uh, but we're really hoping to see some clarity in the next two to three weeks around what future programs are going to look like. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much, Brandon. On behalf of our community, I just want to say thank you. You're incredibly informative, and this was very, very useful. I hope everyone, at least for me, I hope everyone felt the same way. Yeah, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing in compiling people's experiences with the SBA. As I said, it, it's it's addressing a very necessary blind spot in the SBA right now in informing people on what the experiences are like. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And just to mention one last time, a recap, the video of this webinar will be sent around as well as the deck and some other information that we'll include, um, including the link here if you didn't get it. But uh Everyone, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we'll see you soon and, and have a great afternoon.